All right, guys, so this is the second uh, lesson in week 10, which is dealing with um, rotational inertia and then uh, torque. Um, we will get to angular momentum next time. So um, let me let me jump back in with uh, rotational inertia. So, um, so last time we defined that rotational inertia is um, the sum of the masses at their locations squared. And uh, just to review a little bit, I'm going to start with you guys trying to determine which of these two um, rotational inertias you think is going to be larger for this these configurations of the barbells. So let me give you a second to uh, think about that uh, and make a prediction. So here you go. And um, remember, it's based on kind of the mass and the further it is away from the axis of rotation, uh, the eye gets bigger. So if you look at these two setups, you got mass uh, one distance R away here and a mass one distance R away here. You have a mass at the rotational axis and then you have a mass that's two R away. So um, the, the easiest way to do this is to kind of just do the math. But uh, what I would say is that um, B has more mass further or mass further away. So um, it, it, if you imagine trying to rotate these things, it's probably easier to rotate this barbell set uh, through the middle axis than it is on an end. Um, we're going to assume that there's no mass on these rods as well. So uh, in reality, they would be there, but we're going to say that there isn't. So um, so uh, IA or IB, this setup where it's rotating about its uh, end, is larger than when it's rotating about its middle because the distance for B is bigger than the distance for A. So there should be any there. Um, so to do the math, you just use this for each piece. So you have this mass at R away, so that'd be MR squared. And then you have two of those because you have this MR squared and you have this MR squared. So that'd be two MR squared for A. For B, if you do the math, it would be mass at zero. So that one's zero. But for this one, it's mass at two R uh, squared. So two R squared would be four. Uh, so before MR squared. So you can see that this is more difficult to rotate than this. All right, so, uh, so that's kind of the idea of what rotational inertia is again. And now we're going to talk about it for um, a continuous body. So instead of having these like uh, separate pieces, like the mass of one end and the mass of the other end, we have a continuously uh, distributed mass throughout the object. So, um, so this is the equation. So instead of summing up and using sigma, we're going to use an integration term. Um, and we're going to integrate um, for the distance squared uh, for the um, very small integral piece of mass. So um, again, there are already like these calculations have been done for uh, most objects. So um, there's going to be some tables later on that have all these rotational inertias, but it's important that you guys can kind of think through this and, and figure it out. And we'll learn about rotating at some other axis that isn't one of the ones that's in the table and how to adjust. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So, um, so we're gonna uh, practice this by determining uh, if we just have like a rod or a meter stick, um, we wanna find the rotational inertia when we rotate it about uh, one end. So um, the rod has a mass of M and a length of L uh, and we're gonna use I again as that integration of R squared uh, with uh, DM, all right? So we're gonna take this little individual piece of mass um, and we're gonna integrate and find the total um, rotational inertia by finding the integral of dm uh, times r squared. So r uh, would be kind of the length of the rod. Um, and uh, we're doing this about an x-axis, so we're going to use x instead of um, l, so it's fine. So <clears throat> because this rod has a uniform uh, linear density and it's basically one-dimensional, um, we're going to say that the linear density term, uh, which is, this is lambda, is equal to the, the mass of the total rod divided by the length of the rod. Um, if we put that in terms of very small pieces, it would be uh, the integral part of the mass uh, divided by that very small piece of distance that makes up that very small piece of mass. But that's a proportional thing and it's constant, so that's why you can say the total mass of the rod divided by the length is the density, or the total, or this very small piece um, divided by uh, this very small length. So um, we don't really know how to integrate about the mass. So we're gonna try to get it in terms of uh, dx. So if I take uh, this equation, lambda equals dm dx, and I solve for dm, dm ends up being uh, the linear density times uh, dx. So um, 
continuing on with that, we're going to substitute it in for DM, and then we get into something that we can integrate. We also substitute in uh, x instead of uh, r. So it'll be the integral of x squared uh, with this density term times dx. So uh, the density term, as I said before, is a constant because it's a uniform densely object. So like the density of the rod isn't changing as uh, the length changes. So uh, that that's just a constant so it can come out front. And then we have the integration of x squared dx. So that's not that bad. Uh, so it would be the density of the rod times uh, the quantity x cubed divided by 3. So that's like the indefinite integral. And now we're going to measure it for... Uh, our definite integral. So our definite integral goes from the length uh, position zero, which is where there's no mass at the end of the rod, going all the way to the other end of the rod, which is a length L. So uh, when we plug into that definite integral, so essentially what we've done is we've gone and integrated it from, that's supposed to be a zero, uh, to L. So when we plug in L first, it would be the density times L cubed divided by three, because uh, we're just placing it in there. And then if you put a zero in, that last term goes away. So it's just the first term, it's just this L term. Um, and then we're gonna go back and replace what uh, what lambda is, which is M over L. So now we can uh, simplify this term a little bit. Um, and you have um, M, uh, M divided by L times L cubed over three. So it uh, simplifies down to M L squared over three. So a little bit of calculus um, with this idea uh, and just integrating to find that amount. So that is the, uh, rotational inertia um, for that. It's in the right units if you think about it because it's supposed to be a mass per units of length squared. Um, and then we have this coefficient out front which is a third or you can divide by three. So uh, as I mentioned a lot of these uh, ideas have already been solved and are in um, different books. That one that we just did was not on this table. So um, these tables uh, and equations are describing the rotational inertia for these objects about a certain axis. So uh, ones that we'll use later on, not today, but in the next lesson, uh, we'll use the solid sphere about any axis and a um, hollow sphere um, or a shell about a axis, and, and those will be coming up later. Um, the one that's probably closest to the one we just did is this one. So this is integrating it. Um, and finding the rotational inertia about its central point, we did it about an end. So we'll look at another strategy to, to figure that out. Okay, so, um, and that this is the strategy. So the idea here um, is that if you know the um, rotational inertia about um, its the object's center of mass, then you can use what's called the parallel axis theorem to calculate the the rotational inertia about any axis, all right? So it's just equal to the center of mass moment of inertia, which that might be known or given, uh, plus MD squared, where D is the distance away from that center of mass. So uh, we could take that object and rotate it about any object as long as that um, new axis is parallel uh, to the center of mass um, axis that it's rotating through. So, um, I want you guys to go ahead and try to prove that that works for this setup. So um, we rotate it about the end. So instead of having the rod um, kind of at the midpoint, which is what this is, and it makes sense that uh, this is the center of mass because there'd be equal distributions of mass on both sides of the rod. So that's our center of mass and we're rotating about that. So this I equals 1 12th MD squared is uh, the idea for the center of mass uh, rotational inertia. And we're going to take it and we're going to shift that um, that axis. We're going to move this axis of rotation to the end of the rod. So the end of the rod is now uh, the point at which we're rotating it. So my bad drawing trying to mirror this. So we have shifted it and you just have to figure out how much you shifted it and then plug it in here and then uh, clean up the um, term and you will get the same answer that we just calculated for doing the actual integration about the end. So let me pause and give you a second to try to think through that. And um, if you look at this kind of quick uh, summary of what you should do, um, we already know the center of mass uh, rotational inertia I, that's 1 12th ML squared. That's what that first term is. The second term, we basically shifted this um, end of the rod by a half of the total length, so that's L over two. 
So we put the new axes at the end here and we've shifted it a distance away of L over two. So it's M times L over two. And then we have to square it. Don't forget the square. That's the part that people uh, sometimes run in trouble. So if we distribute that square, um, it, this is still 112 ML squared. This turns into ML squared over four. Um, we can take out the coefficients and leave ML squared. So it's 112 plus one fourth. Um, if you do this math, one fourth is the same as um, three twelfths. So that's the same, it's just in a different denominator. If I add those together, I get four over 12, which if you reduce that back down, uh, comes back to one third ML squared, which is what we originally found in that integration that we did just a couple minutes ago. So this is another um, possible way to solve for uh, the, um, the rotational inertia of an object. It's just about some other axis that is parallel to that center of mass axis. So this is the, the blue line here is the center of mass axis because it passes through the center of mass. And this line is parallel to it. So I couldn't do, I couldn't use this idea if I was rotating about um, like through the center of the central axis that goes through the thin rod, but um, I could definitely do it for the one that we just did. All right, so let's try uh, this rotational inertia kind of conceptual question. So it reads, um, this book-like shape or figure um, is um, rotating about one of four axes. So axis one, axis two, axis three, and axis four. Um, and uh, you're supposed to rank uh, according to the rotational inertia from the greatest rotational inertia to the smallest. So again, um, this is kind of a weird shape that you don't probably have a equation for, but you can always use the general I equals the square root or the sigma of uh, M R squared. So the mass and the distribution of the mass related to the axis of rotation. So um, looking at this, uh, let me give you a second to answer. Uh, I would say the axis that is furthest away is going to have the biggest rotational inertia. So I think one is going to have the biggest one. Uh, followed by two because that more mass is still further away in two. Uh, and then it's between these two. So I would say the center of mass, this looks like it would be around the center of mass of that object, um, is going to be the smallest one compared to this one because you've moved it some distance away. So I would say it's one, two, four, three uh, would be the uh, answer that I would uh, recommend is correct. So and that's what the book had too. So that's good. Um, so um, this uh, leads us into our next activity. So if you're in watching the video, um, I'm going to ask you to, you can pause the video here or you can keep watching the video and, and learn about torque. But um, this balancing act simulation is a activity that you would have done in class and that you can do at home. Um, it's on FET. So if you just Google FET and uh, balancing act, um, you'll have this set up and you'll be basically um, two objects on a seesaw and you're trying to get them to balance out. So it's rotational equilibrium and uh, the cause of rotation is torque. So I'll keep going, but this is an activity that you could work on now uh, or do at the end. All right. So uh, torque uh, is represented by this uh, lowercase tau, T-A-U is how that's spelled. Um, and it is the ability of a force to cause a change in rotational motion. That's what torque is. So torque um, is is analogous to force, it's similar to force, uh, but it's a little bit different and it's what causes a change in rotational motion. So it causes things to speed up as they're rotating or slow down as they're rotating. Um, or if it's not rotating at all, it'll cause it to start rotating. So um, it depends on three things. It depends on the amount of force that's being applied, the angle of the force um, in relationship to the axis of rotation. So in which direction uh, are you pushing on it? Um, and then uh, where that force is applied. So there's a couple different factors. They are uh, summarized in this equation. So uh, the torque is equal to RF sine theta. And this is phi, but theta is fine too. So <coughs> we'll come up with a picture in a second, but you're just multiplying the distance from the axis of rotation uh, to where the force is applied, multiplied by the force times the sine of the angle that the um, force makes. Now, sine deals with perpendicular ideas, so that's important, and we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, the unit for torque is measured in, uh, you could say meter or newton meters. I use meter newtons to make it different than joules because it is not energy. So uh, torque is not measuring the amount of energy; it's expressing the uh, kind of rotational uh, ideas. So um, in meter newtons with a direction, uh, and the direction is either positive or negative. Clock 
counterclockwise or clockwise. Same as what we did for other rotations. You use your right hand rule. This right hand rule is a little bit different. Um, so you line your fingers with R. So that's the, like, if this is my rotational axis. So if I had a disc, let's say, and it was rotating around this rotational axis in the middle, um, R is the distance to where the force is applied. So I'm gonna change colors here. So R would be kind of maybe that far if my pushed at that point. So if I imagine pushing on a disc with force F at a distance R away, <coughs> um, by pushing in the way that I am, and the angle would be the angle between the force and um, the R vector. So that's theta there. So, um, so that uh, is is the three factors and that are in this equation. And obviously, if you pushed, then this disc would rotate in that way. So to use the right hand rule, um, you start with your fingers uh, pointing along R, starting at the origin or the where the axis is, and pointing towards where it's going. So I'm gonna have my fingers pointing to the right. I'm gonna curl my fingers in the direction that the force pulls. Um, so the force is pushing up or pulling up and my fingers would curl upward and my thumb would be pointing out of the page. So it'd be pointing towards me. So uh, the rotational torque in this idea would be out of the page. Um, so that's that's essentially it. It's not that different from the first right hand rule we used uh, with directions in kinematics, but um, it's just like curling idea a little bit is a little bit different. Okay. So again, torques that are positive would be counterclockwise and uh, going um, clockwise would be negative. Um, you can have multiple objects or multiple forces acting on an object, uh, sort of like the seesaw that you're going to be working with or you did work with with um, on the balancing act. So like if you had one person sitting on a seesaw here and you had another person sitting on the seesaw here, each one is creating its own torque. So this person is trying to make it rotate that way. This person is trying to create a torque going the opposite way. Um, and to get the net torque, you would need to add them together. Again, you need to worry about direction. So this would be a positive torque <clears throat> and this would be a negative torque. And if I just label them like one and two, I could say this is torque one and this is torque two. When you add those up, you get the net torque. So the net torque would be the sum of the torques. Okay. So it's just looking at multiple objects acting on, um, a body and causing it to rotate through a force at a distance. So each one has their own individual force. It has their own individual R. They have their own individual theta. So you just do that torque equation, RF sine theta, multiple times. All right. So let's try this one. Uh, it reads, the figure show, um, shows the overhead view of a um, of a meter stick that can pivot about the dot. Um, so uh, So this is the dot here. So just pointing out, that's the pivot point. Um, and all five forces on the stick are horizontal and have the same magnitude. Um, so you're trying to rank the forces according to the magnitude of the torque they produce uh, greatest first. So if we look at these, um, this is the point of rotation. So we're gonna measure all of our distances from that point. So we have three different values here. Um, so if I look at the one that's biggest, um, I want the best combination of R and F and sine theta. So they all have the same magnitude of force, it says. Um, so, um, so that's gonna be the same, it's gonna drop out. So it's really just R and sine theta. So if you think about sine theta, sine theta is a maximum uh, when theta is equal to 90 degrees. So that's what we're looking for here. So if it's 90 degrees, um, this one, force one is 90 degrees, force three is 90 degrees. Uh, force four is at some other angle. So you can measure that angle here uh, as theta, or you can measure it um, as the angle from the pipe to, or the bar or whatever it is uh, going that way. It's gonna get you the same value um, for sine theta. And then what's the angle here? So R is going to the right and this force is going to the right. So theta here is zero. So if theta is zero, if you put in zero for sine theta, that goes to zero. So F5 is the, the weakest one that, because that's equal to zero. So that doesn't do anything. Um, the strongest one, uh, it looks like this is 20 away and this is 20 away. So I think F1 and F3 are gonna be the same. So F1 equals F3, they're the biggest. Um, 
if you look at F2, F2 is at the point of rotation. So you're like, you're pushing at the hinge. So that's also going to be zero because R is equal to zero. So uh, F5 is equal to F2 because they're both equal to zero for different reasons. And then uh, F4 is not quite as big as F3, even though it's at the same location, it is at a different angle. Um, so that non 90 degree angle, that non ideal angle is going to make it so that this is the order. Okay, so let's just practice doing a little bit of a net torque or a sum of the net torque. So um, I'm going to label these A, B, uh, C, and D, just so when we calculate the torques for each one, it's not that big a deal. So again, torque, the general equation is RF sine theta. And they give you this grid uh, with uh, the distances that the forces are away. And um, we're going to rotate about the origin. So the point of rotation here is at the origin. So if I look at A, it's four away at a distance or at a force of 40. So it'd be four times 40. And if you think about the angle, that's 90 degrees. So that's going to be the um, sign of one. So that's just going to be 160. And you have to decide if it's positive or negative. So if you think about this, um, if this is like a bar and this pushes up, this thing would rotate that way. Um, so this rotation is in the counterclockwise direction. So I'm going to call that a positive uh, 160 meter newtons. So that's the first one. B is a little bit different. It's probably the one that you are most likely to get incorrect if you were doing it on your own. So that's why I'm talking through it. So this distance here looks like it's one. So that's pretty straightforward. The force is 20. The angle is the part that's a little bit weird here. So this is the sign of the angle. So you can measure the angle from R going to F, that's fine. They only showed you this 60 degrees, which isn't the whole angle, so it'd be 90 plus 60. So you could do sine of 150, and that would work out fine. Or you could use that uh, other side of the angle here, so it's 30. Uh, so you could use sine of 30, and that would work out. Sine of 30, I am more familiar with. Sine of 30 is a half, so it'd be half of 20, which is 10. Okay. Um, and uh, if you think about that, that's going to make it rotate, again, the same direction. So I'm going to call that a positive torque for that one. So that's meter newtons. For um, C, uh, it is a distance, it looks like, of uh, 5 away. So R is 5. Uh, 30 is the amount of force. And then you would do the sine of the angle. So uh, sine, you could use this 53, or you could do 180 minus 53. It's going to be the same value, so I'm just going to use the 53. Um, let me pull that up. So if you put that in your calculator, you get 120 meter newtons. Um, it is positive, again, because it's rotating the same direction as the, all the other ones in counterclockwise direction. And then this D is our oddball that goes the other way. So this one's going to be negative because it's going to try to make it rotate the other way. It would be 3 uh, times 20, uh, which is, and then the sine of 90 again, because it's perpendicular. So um, so that's going to be a negative uh, 60. To get the net torque, all you have to do is add. So we're just going to add positive 60 plus 10 plus 120 minus 60, uh, and you should get the net torque is something like uh, positive 230 for your value there. So that is the net torque acting about this object. So uh, if this object was at rest, it would start rotating in that general positive direction or counterclockwise with that amount of torque acting on it. Okay, so uh, I said that torque was analogous to force and that is true. Um, we measured force using Newton's laws of motion. So we're gonna do that here as well. So uh, to do that, we just rotate or change or translate, excuse me, the, um, idea for uh, F equals MA, the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. That's equal to uh, the rotational uh, analogous term to mass, which is I or rotational inertia. And then uh, for A, our acceleration, we just replaced it with alpha. So um, that is the idea. So it's just F equals MA for rotating bodies, all right? So pretty straightforward. You're just doing that translation. If you don't treat it as anything different, it, it still makes sense. So, cause you remember F equals MA. So, um, so let's try uh, this checkpoint and see if it makes sense here. So um, this figure shows an overhead view of a meter stick. So this is your meter stick. It's pivoted at this point. So it's not about its midpoint. It's about this point shifted towards the left end. Um, and there are two forces, F1 and F2 are applied to the stick. Uh, only F1 is shown and F2 is perpendicular to the stick and is applied at a right angle. So we're, we're trying to figure out 
um, if the stick is not going to turn. So if it's not turning, what does that mean? Um, these two forces are balanced out so that the force, maybe the forces aren't balanced, but the torques are balanced. So torque one has to equal torque two um, if the net torque is equal to zero. So it's like kind of our free body diagram, but it's a rotational body diagram. So we have to figure out where we have to put F2 um, and uh, where is it going? So it says uh, F2 is perpendicular to the stick and it's applied at the right end. So we have a force down here at this end, which is F2. And we're trying to figure out, is it point up or down? So let's answer that question first. Is this force F2 to make this balance gonna point up or down? And hopefully you decided it's gonna point down because this F1 is gonna rotate it that way. And we want F2 uh, to rotate it the opposite way. So uh, F2 is dire definitely directed down. Um, if you look at the R values, that's gonna give you an idea of how you have to, how big F2 needs to be in terms of its size. So if you look at this, this is uh, R1 for F1, and this would be R2 for F2. So the force two is at a bigger distance away. If we wanted to have the same amount of torque as torque one, again, we're using RF sine theta. They're both at 90 degrees, so we don't have to worry about the angle. So sine of 90 is just one, so that goes to one. So um, if you think about this force, this, this distance is small. Um, and that force would be big to get a kind of medium sized torque. Uh, if we have a big distance, so R2 uh, is large, uh, in order to keep the same amount of torque, uh, F is gonna have to be small. So you need the relationship that F2 uh, is less than or smaller than F1. That's, that's what you need in order to get the torque to be balanced. Okay, um, let's go ahead and try a, a problem just to make sure you guys are doing okay. This kind of ties in kinematics to it as well. Um, so it says uh, fan blades on a jet have a moment of inertia of 30 kilogram meters squared, so that's I. Uh, and it says in 10 seconds, so that's T, they rotate from rest up to a rate of 20 revs per second. So 20 revs per second would be the final omega or the mega later on and starting from rest so omega naught is equal to zero. And we're gonna to try to find uh, what torque is needed to make that rotation happen. So we're looking for torque. Um, we would use I alpha. Uh, we know I, we need to get alpha. Hopefully we can get alpha. You can get alpha. You can use kinematics or you can just use alpha equals the change in omega over the change in time. It's a constant acceleration because it's a constant torque. That makes sense. So it's force and, um, Force and uh, torque are the same idea, so, or the same kind of general idea. So if alpha, uh, if torque is constant, then alpha is constant because the rotational inertia is not changing. So um, so you would plug into this and, and get an answer. Um, B is basically the same part or same type of question, except this time it's slowing down. So um, make sure you convert from revs per second into rads per second. Uh, the answers here are hidden. So that is kind of the work shown out and I'm gonna, keep moving because you can pause the video and watch this if you need and, and kind of check your answer. Okay. Right? Um, so uh, we're done. We're not done with torque. We'll come back and deal with torque later. You're going to do uh, an in-person lab for torque as well. But um, the idea here is that we're going to move past torque and we're going to get into some of the other ideas that we um, discussed in um, dynamics and kinematics and energy and, and, and those concepts that deal with rotation. So uh, we've already talked about rotational kinetic energy. That's one half I omega squared. Uh, if you want the change in kinetic energy, you would just take the difference in those uh, rotational kinetic energies. So you can see that there. And that's equal to the work, right? So work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Um, and if you're going to do a the work done in one rotation, um, we're, our old equation for work for our linear, um, it was um, the sum of the force uh, dx from like zero to X or whatever length you were uh, measuring. This is gonna be um, the same idea. It's just we're changing uh, force is now substitute for torque and for DX we have D theta. So uh, that is our uh, work integration term or work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Uh, we can also relate power. Um, so power was work over time or instantaneous power was uh, DW DT. That hasn't changed. It's just now we have uh, different concepts. So we're going to use torque. Uh, so we would take this term and plug it in there. So it'd be D um, tau D theta 
uh, over uh, d t. So um, if we group that, so that's over d t too. So um, so this is like d theta uh, d t. That's uh, sorry, I have an extra term. That's just this angular speed. So this is torque equals uh, torque times omega is equal to the power instantaneously. So that instantaneous velocity times the torque that's acting that'll get you the power. Um, that's the same as we did force times velocity. So these, these again, are just translations. I don't like to think of them as new ideas. It's just the same stuff that we've talked about in a different language. It's in Greek to represent rotation. All right, so, um, so we have lots of um, equations now. So we've, we've kind of gone through uh, these ideas. So position is angular, position, um, velocity, acceleration, mass, uh, all these ideas. It's the same concepts, it's just you're substituting in the uh, Greek letter instead of the typical um, letter that we've dealt with uh, in English. So uh, again, uh, all the way through, we got kinetic energy, power, and work. So, uh, so that's it, that's, that's the ideas that I wanted to cover in this lesson. Next time, we will start with um, rotational uh, inertia or angular momentum, or we did rotational inertia, but we'll, we'll talk about that and how it affects angular momentum.